All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to Classics 160 D2 Classical Mythology and today's lecture 7.1 on Hermes the messenger god and as we will see he is far more than just a uh, messenger god. All right, so let's go ahead and see what we got on the docket today. We're going to start with uh, some announcements, a brief recap. I'm getting a question here about our exam. I'll mention that very, very briefly in the announcements. Uh, we will start talking about Hermes in the kind of uh, form that we know him best, right, as the messenger god. And then we're going to talk about all the other things he's related to. Um, then, perhaps one of the greatest parts of all the lectures, we will talk about ithyphallic tropaism. And if you don't know what that is, just... Get really excited. It's awesome. And finally, we'll close today with the, uh, the progeny of Hermes, uh, the crazy cat known as Pan, and his pursuit uh, of the nymph Syrinx. So that is our plan for today. So let's go ahead and jump right in uh, to announcements. And what do we have today? All right, so you guys know the basic ones, right? Put your screen into speaker view. You know that. You can see me. You can see the notes. Excellent. Uh, if you have questions, go ahead and um, get in touch with your TA, get in touch with uh, somebody who's not me because I have a hard time answering it and speaking at the same time. I'm just, I think one of my worst qualities, if I ever got that, like during an interview, I would say multitasking. I'm terrible at multitasking. I can't do two things at once, no matter what those two things are. So, I don't know. <laughs> I guess that's not so good of a thing, but there you have it. Um, okay, uh, research proposals, right? Your TAs have been doing a fabulous job of getting you those weekly reading assignments uh, or writing assignments back very, very quickly. It's going to take a little bit longer with the, uh, the research proposals because you're going to get more substantive feedback, right? And not only are you going to want to kind of read that feedback to understand why you got the grade you did, you're going to want to read that feedback so that you can take it into account um, moving forward towards the final draft and eventually the final product. Uh, project. So keep an eye out for it. We're going to try to have those by Friday. Uh, at the very latest, latest it'll be uh, the following Monday, a week from today. Um, okay, and then midterm exam, it's a good time to start getting that on the radar. The exam is going to be during class time next Friday. Okay, so Friday, October 16th, during class is when the exam is going to happen. All right, you don't need to show up to Zoom, right? There's no like, zoom instructions or anything like that what's going to happen is just like the quizzes right the daily attendance quizzes are built into d2l and that they're open only at certain times your midterm is going to open at 11 a.m on october 16th and then you'll have 50 minutes to do it all right uh the basic idea of this is it's going to be at least it's going to be one or two essays and i'll clarify that as the week progresses uh, as well as some multiple choice questions it's going to be open note but time is gonna be the limiting factor, okay? So I'm gonna tell you right now that if you have to look up every single answer and like go through videos to find every single one of the, uh, the multiple choice answers, the essays are gonna suffer because you're just not gonna have enough time to write them, okay? Um, so you're gonna to want to have your notes ready to go. Obviously, definitely feel free to like check them out, double check answers, that sort of thing. Hopefully, it'll be kind of intermittent checking your notes during the multiple choice, so then you've got, you know, somewhere in the realm of, uh, of about half the, the exam, right? 25, 30 minutes or so for the, the essays themselves, okay? So that's the plan with that. You can find a study guide online. Uh, the study guide might say it's multiple choice only. If that's the case, disregard that. That is last year's stuff. They didn't have an essay, but they also couldn't use, your note, use their notes. So is that good or bad? I don't know. Depends who you are. Um, Okay, students want to know how many questions. Uh, let's go ahead and say, let's say 25 multiple choice questions worth two points each. And do you guys, okay, oh, I'm going to start a poll. Let's see if we can, we can do a poll here. All right. Uh, edit. All right, you guys just have to bear with me right here. All right, we're going to start a poll question. And the, the question is going to be, would you prefer one essay that's worth like a lot of points or two essays that's worth half of a lot of points. So, all right, do you, how, let's see, how many essays 
do you want? All right, very good. Very good. There we go. There we go. All right. So you guys have 30 seconds to answer this thing. So again, if you have more essays, like you, you kind of spread out the possibility of like, um, you know, not knowing the one thing that shows up and then botching it big time. But you have to kind of know more because you got to speak intelligently at at least two different things. This is incredibly close. All right, we'll give it we'll give it the full minute. Twenty five more seconds. Uh, how long are the essays? The essays are as long as you want them to be, right? Um, so there's no word minimum. There's no word maximum. They'll be graded based on the the quality and quantity of your uh, your response. Okay, um, so that's why you're going to want to leave probably at the very least about half the time to do those essays. Okay, one essay it is. Uh, Another question, do we have to cite sources for the essays? You don't need to do in-text citations, right? You don't need the parenthetical citations. I do think it might be useful uh, to kind of mention sources, right? So like, as we saw in Hesiod's Theogony, um, the gods can like have very different aspects to them, right? So like in Hesiod's Theogony, Zeus is like uh, very, or very judgmental. In the Iliad, he's kind of aloof something like that, right? So you don't need parenthetical citations. Using, like referring to different texts as a way to support your answer, that's a good idea, right? Anytime you're making an argument, supporting it with specifics, always good. All right, 25 multiple choice questions, one essay. Will I give you the essay question ahead of time? No, I won't give you the essay question ahead of time, but I will do one of two things, all right? I will either give you a laundry list of essay questions, I'll give you like 10 or 15 of them. And I'll say one of those is going to be on there. Or I will give you uh, some example questions that won't be on the exam, but that give you a sense for kind of the type of question that would show up. All right. So one of those two I will do. That will happen by Friday. If it doesn't happen by Friday, blame the TAs. <laughs> No, don't blame the TAs. It will happen by Friday, okay? Um, and the way that this is going to work, again, 25 multiple choice questions, two points each, one essay, 50 points, all right? That's going to add up to the full score of your exam, and you should plan on spending about half the time doing the multiple choice and about half the time on the essay. Uh, the study guide can be found on D2L um, starting under this week, all right? And again, if it says only multiple choice, don't pay attention to the, that part of the study guide. All right. Okay, let's move on. We got to talk about Hermes. Um, okay, very good. Is the study guide very helpful? No, it's not that helpful. Um, it's it's kind of like if you just took good notes over uh, all the lectures so far and wrote down all the names and myths and sources and stuff like that, and then put them in a big list. That's what the study guide is. All right. So, right, last week we talked about Athena and Poseidon, and with Athena we talked about her relationship with wisdom, and craftsmanship, and weaving, and warfare, and not just any warfare, but the really good aspects of warfare, uh, and how she's kind of a goddess of um, the civic world, right, of cities, and of urbanism, that sort of thing. And then we talked about Poseidon, how in some ways he's the opposite, right? Uh, he is the god of, like, the sea. He's a very wild god, right? He's associated with horses and earthquakes, kind of chaotic things. And they come together in the contest for Athens, right? They are both vying to become the patron god or goddess of the city of Athens. And Athena, of course, with her gift of the olive tree, wins that. And that's why we call it Athens and not Poseidonia, right? Although there are Poseidonias in the ancient world, uh, and in particular, one of the coolest ones is actually not in Greece, but in southern Italy. Uh, it's the modern town of Pestum. And uh, if you go study abroad in Italy, you'll go down there. It has some of the best preserved Greek temples in all of the ancient world. Uh, it's, it's really just like temple after temple after temple, monumental Greek temples, plus a cool Roman city. 
It's a beautiful place. Oh, and it's right on the beach. So it's a uh, pretty sweet place to go. Check out Italy Study Abroad. We'll talk more about that. Uh, and when will we talk more about that? Next week? How about right after the midterm? Right after the midterm. Maybe that'll have dissuaded everybody from going to study abroad, though. I don't know. Sometime soon. We'll talk about Italy and Greece and all that great stuff. Um, okay, the other thing we talked about last week, right, was how all of these things with Athena uh, end up playing out in the city of Athens, right? And hopefully you guys know right by now that this is known as a whole as the Acropolis, right? If you know that sort of thing, that's good. If you didn't know that, you're going to have a lot of studying to do. Uh, and we talked about the four major buildings that are still extant on the Acropolis. Uh, the Propylaea, which is the monumental gateway right here. We talked about the Temple of Athena Nike, right? The Athena, but the goddess, uh, or the kind of version of Athena associated with victory. That's that tiny little baby temple right on the, uh, this kind of projecting area right here. We talked about the Big Mama, also known as the Parthenon, right here, right? Uh, this is by far the most famous Greek temple in uh, the entire world. And then the weird looking temple over here, the Erechtheion, which marks the spot uh, both of the, uh, the, the kind of burials of some of the earliest leaders of Athens, um, Erechtheus and Kekrops, as well as the site for that contest for Athens, right? Where Poseidon strikes his trident into the Acropolis uh, and Athena gives her gift of the, uh, the olive tree. And you can kind of see here, right? It's the only tree. Well, I guess there's a tree over there. I was always told it was the only tree on the Acropolis. Huh, go figure. <laughs> Who knew? Anyway, let's dive in to, uh, to Hermes, the messenger god. All right, so you can see the big overview here, right? Uh, Hermes is one of the Olympians, but he's not of that same generation as, uh, as Zeus um, and Hera and Poseidon and Hades. He's the son of Zeus and the nymph uh, Maya, and we will hear that story in just a second. Um, as you can see, he's rather prolific uh, with his uh, relationships and his offspring, and then when we get to all these cult titles, this gives you a sense for all the different things that Hermes is the god of. Now, when you're identifying Hermes, we'll talk about this in a second, right? What you want to look for is the, uh, the wand or the caduceus, the winged uh, sandals, the hat uh, that sometimes also has wings on it. So a couple of things you can see visually to identify Hermes uh, in art. Okay, so there are two different ways to uh, represent Hermes, right? There are two different ways that he's represented in the ancient Greek iconography. So sometimes he's just represented as a human, all right? So we can see him over here with his winged sandals and his winged cap and his wand, the caduceus. Uh, that's obviously a modern depiction. Over here, you can see an actual ancient Greek vase with the depiction of Hermes uh, with similar attributes, all right? So he's got the winged sandals, he's got the caduceus. Um, this time, he's got a beard, you'll notice, over here, no beard. That actually happens within ancient Greek art as well. And one of the reasons for that is because one of the things Hermes is associated with is kind of the transition from youth to adulthood, all right? Uh, and we'll talk more about that as we go on, but you'll see him both ways, right? The beard symbolizes him in full adulthood, uh, the, the kind of shaved face, or the, the clean-shaven face, yeah, is, is him being represented as a youth. We also see Hermes represented as the creatively named Herms, all right? So a Herm is what you're looking at over here. And these are stone pillars, all right? Uh, and you can see that they, they basically take the human form and condense it down into two heads, right? So we've got the Hermes head right here. We've got the phallus down here. And the kind of what scholars think is going on with these is that these are an evolution of something known as Hermes Hills, all right? And what these are, are little basically like kind of piles of stones, right, that, that mark different pathways and junctions uh, and trails between cities, all right? Now you think of the ancient world, they don't have a highway system like we have today, right? And so, it's a dangerous world when you're traveling from place to place. And so these little markers would be a way of showing which roads were safe to travel on, uh, which roads would get you from point A to point B safely. And as a result, one of the things Hermes is the god of 
is kind of the god of travelers, right? He's a messenger god. He's also the patron god of other people who are traveling, other people who are messengers, that sort of thing, right? So he's a messenger and the patron saint of messengers. Uh, and again, what people think is going on with these herms uh, is basically a kind of um, abstraction or an evolution of these very early rock piles. And you've probably seen them, right? If you've been hiking yourself, little piles as people uh, kind of, that people pile up to mark trails um, out in nature. Okay, so Hermes, the messenger god. There, there we go, one thing. Um, one of the ways he's the messenger god is that he is a messenger of souls, right, from the real actual world down into Hades, okay? And so we'll remember from the story of Demeter and Hades and Persephone that Hermes is one of the main people uh, basically going down into Hades to get her back out, right? So here we see a more modern depiction of youthful Hermes with his caduceus, the wand here, bringing Persephone back out of Hades. And for normal people, he would be kind of doing the opposite, I guess, right? Once you die, he's taking your soul down into Hades. Okay, so Hermes, the bearer of souls, one kind of version of him being a messenger. He's also a messenger kind of of the gods, all right? So in addition to, in addition to kind of being the god of messengers and travelers of like normal people, right? One of the other things is that he's also kind of a messenger of the gods themselves, taking messages to other gods, as well as a messenger between like kind of the gods and mortals. And so, for example, one of the ways that we see this um, is in the Odyssey, all right? And Zeus has to get a message uh, to Calypso that she's got to release Odysseus. And of course, Hermes, the messenger god, is the guy to deliver that message from Olympus down to Calypso, right? So he's taking souls down to the underworld, he's taking messages between gods, and he's also taking messages from the gods to mortals. All right, now let's take a look at identifying Hermes, right? Um, so we've got three things that you wanna kind of pay attention to when it comes to trying to identify him, right? So we've got the, uh, the traveler's cap right here. Sometimes this makes him uh, invisible, depending on the story that you're, uh, that you're kind of reading at the time. We've got the winged sandals right here. Um, and this is kind of interesting, right? So when we get Nike shoes, they're associated with Athena Nike, right? Athena, the goddess of victory, but they're also kind of sort of associated with Hermes because he's the guy actually with, um, uh, with winged sandals, right? Like winged shoes that make him very, very fast. So Nike shoes kind of associated with both of them. Um, and then of course we've got the caduceus and you can recognize the caduceus. Uh, it's this kind of wand or scepter or stick right here and it's got the wings on it, as well as two intertwined snakes. All right, so we can see the invisible cap, right? We can see the wing sandals, and we can see the, uh, the caduceus. So look for those three things. If you see those, you are almost certainly dealing with Hermes. Now, this is kind of one of the interesting, um, I don't know, side stories here, right, uh, is that when, you know, if you're at all like associated with uh, healthcare, you've probably seen something like this before. Um, and it's the caduceus, which is kind of weird because the caduceus is associated with Hermes, which is associated with like commerce, negotiation, that sort of thing. We'll see Hermes is also kind of a god of trade. Um, and the rod of Asclepius is very, very similar. And Asclepius is one of the gods of healing. He's one of the major gods of like medicine and healing. And his staff looks very, very similar. So you're going to want to note the differences, right? So the caduceus of Hermes, it's got the staff, it's got wings on it, and two snakes. Whereas the rod of Asclepius, it's the staff, no wings, and a single snake. And this is the one associated with healing. This is the one associated uh, with commerce and negotiation and traveling. And it's kind of interesting uh, because when we look at like the medical world today, we actually see both of these things used. So the medical, like the U.S. medical court uses the caduceus 
And they kind of seem to just have gotten it wrong and not paid attention in their classical mythology class. Um, they came up with some justification for why it made sense, but it, it doesn't really make sense. Um, but yeah, they chose the thing that, you know, really is more associated with commerce and negotiation rather than healing and medicine. Whereas if you look at the blue shield from Blue Cross Blue Shield, now you're looking at the rod of Asclepius. We'll get to him later when we talk about Apollo, um, the god of healing and his staff that has the single snake wrapped around it. So interesting side story okay but where does hermes get the caduceus i know everybody's wondering that um and it all goes back to the story of tiresias this this poor old shepherd here wandering around right so old tiresias is just wandering around the fields and one day he finds two snakes right a nice male snake and a nice female snake and they're they're doing their little getting busy snake style, however that looks, all wrapped up and entwined together, right? Now, nobody knows why this happens, but he's either jealous, or he hated snakes and he didn't want any more of them, or whatever, right? But he takes his staff and bam, he hits the female snake right on the head, kills her immediately, right? With his shepherd's staff. And it actually is because when you're a shepherd, you want to do that to snakes because, you know, they, they bite your flock and, and they die. So he kills the female snake. Turns out, bad idea. Bad idea, Tiresias. What ends up happening is as soon as the snake dies, Tiresias is immediately transformed from an old, like, dude shepherd into a woman. And not a good-looking woman. Not a slamming hottie. Very, very ugly. Poor Tiresias. Poor Tiresias. Okay. So, for seven more years, right, as, an, as a, like, not very attractive lady, he's got to tend his flock, right, um, and still keep the same job, but now as a woman. And then one day, seven years later, old Tiresias finds the male snake, all right, and uh, the one that had been getting it on with the female snake that he killed. And then he takes his staff, and bam, he hits the male snake right over the head, kills it immediately. And that changes everything, right? So, for whatever reason, that turns Tiresias back into a dude. And at this point in time, the staff, the thing that he used to kill both of the snakes, is imbued with magical powers, right? So the snakes, the, the female snake and the male snake, somehow the female snake like comes back to life, as well as the male snake, and they start wrapping themselves around the staff of Tiresias, and this becomes uh, the caduceus, and as a result, one of the things that becomes one of the kind of powers of the caduceus is that it ends up uh, kind of gaining this power of being able to transform things. All right. So just like uh, the, the snakes transformed him, transformed him into a woman and then back into a man. <clears throat> and just like the snakes transform the caduceus, the caduceus itself transforms uh, other things. All right. So the staff of Hermes, also known as the Caduceus. All right. So, so far, we've seen kind of Hermes as the uh, the messenger god, right? So messenger god in terms of like the Hermes hills, right? Guiding travelers, uh, eventually becoming Herms. The messenger god in terms of being the messenger of dead souls down to Hades. The messenger god taking messages between gods and between gods and mortals. But Hermes is the god of much, much more, right? So we talked a little bit about this already, uh, but he's the god. Uh, one of his epithets is Hermes Enodius, or Hermes of the Roads. And he's venerated by travelers because he helps people on those dangerous roads, right? Like, it really is hard to kind of place yourself back into antiquity and think of how difficult it would have been to just go from point A to point B. Right? Like, if you travel from one city to another, there's not, like, a big police system or something like that that keeps somebody with, like, a big club from just, like, bopping you over the head and taking all your stuff. So traveling's dangerous, and uh, Hermes is one of the guys that protects you along the way. Um, he's also kind of on the road himself, again, taking messages. So what we see here is that at the end of the Iliad, when Priam, the king of Troy goes uh, to try to beg for the, the body of his son, right? Try to get the body of his son back. 
it's Hermes who's able, able to kind of protect him, lead him through uh, the, uh, the, the Greek army and get him in uh, to the, the camp of the Greek leaders in order to, to make that request. Uh, we also see, right, his association with the underworld. Um, and so, again, he's the one bringing the souls from the regular world down into the underworld. Uh, and these things similar to Hermes Hills and similar to the Herms, right, those kind of pillars, are very frequently used as grave markers. And we can see that in this vase over here, right? So this is a tomb right here. People are mourning, pouring libations at the tomb. Uh, and this is... Uh, this is like something that looks very similar to one of those Herms um, in the background. All right, uh, he's also, yep, we talked about this already, right? Called the escort people down into the underworld. And he's also very popular uh, in what are known as curse tablets. Um, oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I can, here's what I'll do. Okay, sorry, I've got some comments that it's hard to read these things. Let me go ahead and shrink myself a little bit. And you guys can read this. There we go. Uh, he's also very popular in uh, in cursed tablets, and cursed tablets uh, are these very cool things. So uh, one of the things that happens in the ancient world is if you want to, um, well, curse anybody, curse your neighbor and like steal his wife, or like uh, curse like the person you owe money to and hope they die so you don't have to repay the money. What you do is you get these like little thin sheets of lead. And either you or somebody, you know, or a scribe kind of writes down this formulaic curse on it, cursing these people. Um, and you get it directed all over the place. Neighbors, love rivals, business competition, all sorts of these things. And very frequently they invoke, uh, invoke Hermes, um, as well as the, uh, the deities of the underworld, in order uh, to make those kind of curses actually come to life and come true. All right, now we're going to talk more about this uh, on Wednesday when we talk about Dionysus. But one of the rituals and festivals that Hermes is associated with is known as the Anthesteria, uh, or the, the Flower Festival. And again, this is mainly in honor of Dionysus, um, but also in a different kind of way, a little bit of Hermes as well. Um, it takes place every spring, and uh, it's that time of year where the, the, the New Year's kind of casks of wine are opened, right? So it's a ritual opening of the wine for the year. And it's also symbolizing, right? Opening the wine is also symbolizing opening the entrance to the underworld. Now, uh, during the festival, there's drinking, there's a sacred wedding. We'll go into the details on Wednesday. But one of the things that happens at the end of the festival is that all these... Um, all the people, right, they, they kind of have these masks, people wearing masks of the dead during the festival. Uh, but at the end, they all need to kind of be banished back to the underworld. And that's where Hermes comes in again to take the souls back to the underworld. And as a result of this, um, as a result of this, this kind of attribute, right, or, or this kind of function, we get one of Hermes like kind of greatest nicknames, right? In Greek, it's like psychopomp, Hermes psychopomp. That's one of his epithets. And what that translates as is Hermes, the, uh, the escort um, of souls. And then, of course, what we're looking at here, right, is like the, uh, the all souls procession um, in Tucson here, which is a very kind of cool thing. And, and I don't know, the, the stories of Hermes made me think of that sort of thing where you have one night where all the souls come out, you commemorate uh, the deceased, um, as a way to, uh, to celebrate. Okay, so let's move now uh, to one of, again, the best part of all the lectures, the Ithyphallic Herms. Um, so when we're uh, using the term Ithyphallic here, right? Um, think of this as a fancy, formal, academic way of saying uh, a, yeah, like an erect, uh, Hermes, okay? Um, so Ithyphallic is basically a um, woodiness or an erection or a boner version of a Herm, all right? And again, many people think that these things, these Herms right here, end up arising from Hermes Hills. And when we see them, right, what we associate these with are both protection and fertility. 
right? So the fertility is perhaps a little bit obvious, but these iffy phallic herms and other forms uh, that have some sort of iffy phallic attribute end up also being a form of protection. Okay, so we're gonna come back to that a little bit later in the lecture today. Uh, but first we're gonna talk about the, uh, the birth of Hermes, okay? And we've talked already that uh, Hermes is the, the son of Zeus and this nymph Maya. And Maya's the daughter uh, of the Titan Atlas, and she's very, very beautiful, right? Just a gorgeous lady. And she lives alone in a cave in the middle of Arcadia, all right? And Arcadia is like, it's in the middle of the Peloponnese, out in the mountains. Think very, very remote, nature-filled area, not many people there. Um, so she's living all alone. And so Zeus looks down on her one day, and he's like, oh, well, she's awfully beautiful. I should probably just leave her alone. Now, of course Zeus doesn't think that at all, right? He doesn't leave her alone. Uh, he goes down there in the middle of the night, and they go into this, like, dark-ass cave, and they get busy together, and Zeus is doing his thing, and Maya is... Well, they, the myths don't really talk a lot about her agency in the situation. Um... But it, it doesn't make a big deal of her being forced, at least, here. And uh, one of the things is that nine, actually not nine months later, immediately, by the next morning, Hermes is born. Okay, so immediately from the birth of Hermes, it is emphasizing the speed at which uh, he's born. Okay, or the speed at which he moves, right? Like his growth, his birth is already highlighting just how fast he is. Okay, so Hermes is born, and he starts growing up really, really fast, right? So Maya, the mom, right, wraps him up in these, like, little swaddling clothes, these little baby clothes. But when she falls asleep, he, like, gets out of those clothes and runs away. And he starts running, and he's running, and he's running, and he's running. And he runs all the way from Arcadia, all the way to Thessaly, all right? So Arcadia is down here, Thessaly's up here, and Hermes, with his speed, he's running very, very fast all the way up to Thessaly. And when he gets up there, he finds the cattle of Apollo, right? So Apollo is grazing his cattle, and sneaky little clever Hermes steals the cattle of Apollo. And then with his speed, he starts racing all the way back down to the Peloponnese, right? Way back down here with the cattle of Apollo. But he's marching them backwards so that when Apollo tries to track them down, he can't follow the, the footprints, right? Because they're going the opposite direction. Now, some old dude he meets along this, along this way, this old guy, Batos. He sees him, and uh, Batos sees him with the cattle of Apollo, and he's going to tell on him. But Hermes is like, hey, hey, bro, just like, how about don't tell on me, and you're going to have an awesome harvest, and you're going to be really blessed in life. And so Hermes is already, like, using his charm to, to make things work for him. Okay, so he's still walking the, uh, the cattle back way down to the Peloponnese, way down to, um, uh, yeah, down to the Peloponnese. And he sees a little turtle, right? A little cute little turtle along the way. And naturally, he's like, oh, I should make a guitar out of that. And so he, like, guts the turtle, uh, and then he uses the sinews of an animal uh, to create the strings. And there you go. You have the world's first guitar or lyre, right? So something looking like here. And that is the precursor of the kithara, which is actually the word where we get our word guitar, right? So he really is making the world's first guitar out of a little turtle uh, and the intestines of one of these, uh, these cattle that he, he brought down to the Peloponnese. All right, so he's stolen the cattle. He's created the world's first guitar. He's blessed this guy, Batus, with a great, um, a great harvest. And Apollo's furious, okay? So... Uh, Apollo comes down uh, and he confronts Maya and um, Maya at this point looks back down to see where the baby is and somehow like little baby Hermes is like re-wrapped himself into like the swaddling clothes and he's just like I'm a tiny baby how how could I have done it I'm just a tiny little baby and everybody knows that he he's done it and then Zeus gets brought into this whole thing right and uh, Zeus, like, comes down, and Apollo's there, and tiny baby Hermes is there, and the nymph Maya is there. And Zeus is like, look, tiny baby Hermes, quit being a little brat. 
give Apollo his cattle back. They're not your cattle. And then Tiny Baby Hermes is like, well, he just pulls out his, his like tortoise guitar and he just starts jamming on his tortoise guitar, right? And Apollo, all of a sudden, is like, holy crap, that's amazing. Where did you get a tortoise guitar? And then Apollo's like, you know, they come to a deal. And basically, Apollo's like, you give me the tortoise guitar and you can just keep the cattle. This tortoise guitar is fantastic. And so Tiny Baby Hermes gives Apollo the tortoise guitar. And we can see a statue of Apollo with the lyre or Kythera up here. Um, that all started with the tortoise one and Tiny Baby Hermes down here. And everybody walks away happy. I really like this story because so many Greek myths end in like, and then the woman got thrown into the fire and burned for eternity. But not this one. This one's like, it all works out. And uh, everybody just goes away jamming on their tortoise guitars. Okay, so uh, speaking of crazy tiny little babies, Hercules was also a crazy tiny little baby strangling snakes. We'll talk about that in the second half of the course. Go ahead and take two minutes uh, to put in yellow for today. October 5th, attendance 15, put in yellow, and we will pick it back up at 1140. All right, yellow for today, let's get back to it. All right, there we go. Um, so we see that this is actually not Hermes' only association with musical instruments at the end of today, or maybe at the beginning of Wednesday, we will also see uh, about his offspring, uh, Pan, who ends up inventing the creatively named Pan Pipe, also known as the Syrinx. Um, he also invented the, the flute, very similar to the, uh, the Pan Pipe. Okay, so, uh, Hermes is associated with fertility. Uh, again, you don't need to remember like kind of the exact um, uh, epithets associated with these, right? Uh, when we're going through them kind of at this speed, but do realize that Hermes uh, associated with fertility as well as um, with being the messenger, uh, as well as music, that sort of thing. Okay, now back to uh, the idea of rather iffy phallic uh, apotropaism, right? So ithyphallic, again, kind of meaning uh, erect, and apotropaism, right, or apotropaic, uh, is basically a, a word that means um, warding off evil, okay? And so when we see uh, different ithyphallic representations in Greco-Roman antiquity, they tend to have both a, um, a kind of association with fertility for 
obvious reasons, as well as, uh, as kind of this association with warding off evil. And so you'll very, very frequently see uh, that forms of kind of, uh, you know, images of iffy phallic uh, Hermes or iffy phallic uh, Priapus, which is uh, one of the kind of minor gods who's very closely associated with such things here, are put at the corners, uh, put at intersections of roads, are put in front of shops, put in front of houses, uh, basically as a way to ward off evil from those spaces. And you can see a fresco from Pompeii over here. Now, you can think to the, the kind of modern world and other settings of different versions of like apotropaism, right? So if you've ever seen like kind of the depiction of the evil eye, right? The, this happens in a lot of different cultures, Greece, Turkey, uh, different parts of the world. And uh, the evil eye is doing something very, very similar, right? The idea is that you put this at entrance ways to different things as a way to ward off evil from that context. And in the ancient world, right, in addition to iffy phallic representations, we see other things doing something similar as well. So that the head of Medusa is actually another uh, apotropaic um, image that is put in different places in order to ward off evil. And so we see that, for example, right, on the, the kind of um, when we saw the statue of Athena, right, we saw Medusa right there warding off evil. What we're looking at here is these cisterns under the city of uh, Istanbul. Super cool stuff. If you ever make it to Istanbul, you have to go down into the water cisterns. These are ancient Roman cisterns, right? So even though what's above uh, was constructed later, these cisterns go all the way back to the Roman period. And when you make your way through this, you can actually see uh, the head of Medusa put in different places, again, as a way to kind of ward off evil. So here's a head of Medusa put upside down. Here's another head of Medusa put on its side, kind of basically serving as the base of columns in some of these cisterns. Okay, so we've seen uh, iffy phallic imagery as, a, um, as associated with both fertility and apotropaism. We've seen like the evil eye is like a modern version uh, of apotropaism warding off evil. We've seen the, the image of Medusa does something similar in terms of, uh, in terms of warding off evil. And again, what we're looking at here uh, is uh, either Hermes, right? So we see Hermes uh, right here. We see Hermes here. We see Herms over here, right? Looking very, very iffy phallic. Um, and then one of these minor gods known as Priapus. You don't need to, to remember that name for, for this class. But he's also very, um, very frequently depicted with a enlarged member. And uh, so we can see that rather hopefully disproportionate in this little terracotta figurine. This is a, um, another fresco from Pompeii, from the, the house of the Vedii. So you can go see this when you go to Pompeii. Uh, I don't know if you can tell what he's doing here with his enlarged member. He's uh, weighing it on a scale and he's weighing it against a sack of gold. And so in addition to being um, both a sign of fertility and warding off evil, it's also seen as kind of a, uh, a symbol of prosperity, right? Kind of fertility, not just physically, right, having offspring, but fertility in uh, your kind of business ventures as well. And we know that the Vedii were pretty wealthy people because of their house. So, um, all right, when you see something that looks like this, know that it's warding off evil, that it's also symbolizing fertility, and that fertility can be uh, found not just in, um, not just in the physical realm uh, of having offspring, but also in the kind of commercial realm of becoming wealthy. Now, one of the great stories, right, to, to hear more about this, you'll have to take one of the history courses, Meet the Ancients or something like that. Uh, but one of the great stories revol uh, involving Herms, okay, uh, takes place at the beginning of the, uh, towards the beginning. Eh, I guess it's right in the middle. Of the Peloponnesian War, all right? So the Peloponnesian War is the big battle between Athens and Sparta, right? So after Athens, right, Matt, Matt was talking about this uh, last week, right? After Athens defeats Persia, well, the, after the Greeks defeat Persia, Athens has like a booming 
uh, a booming economy for like 50 years. And the rest of Greece gets so scared of Athens becoming so, so powerful that they basically have to do something to stop it. And Sparta's the one to kind of step up and take the fight to Athens. And so within 100 years of the Greeks beating the Persians, they've started a civil war with each other, with Athens and a uh, kind of coalition on one side and Sparta leading the Peloponnesian League on the other side. Um, and in the middle of this war, we get one of the great characters in all of Greek history, this guy Alcibiades. Alcibiades or Alcibiades and he's an Athenian general and he's a crazy dude okay so he decides that the way to win the war is for Athens to take all their ships sail across the entire Mediterranean and go conquer the entire island of Sicily okay and if that seems like a bad way to defeat Sparta which again is not in Sicily Sparta is in Greece you're right it's a terrible idea so the, the night before Athens, like he convinces Athens that this is a good idea somehow. And the night before they're supposed to like launch all the ships, Al Alcibiades runs around the city. He's gotten very, very drunk with his friends. And he starts chopping off the, the phalluses of all the herms, which is not a good omen, right? These things are supposed to bring you protection and good luck and fertility. It's not a good uh, omen if the guy whose idea it was to invade Sicily, goes around and chops the wieners off all the herms. So they end up basically putting him in jail for a while. Eventually, he uh, ends up sailing to Sicily. Eventually, at some point in the war, he goes over to Sparta, and he becomes like a Spartan general. And then at one point in time, Athens has it so bad in the war that after he's become a traitor and joined the Spartans, the Athenians like welcome him back and make him a leader again. Uh, really, really kind of weird situation, but kind of one of the interesting ways in which uh, actual Greek history and Greek mythology end up intersecting uh, with good old Alcibiades chopping the wieners off of Herms. So I think uh, that is a as good a point as any to, uh, to wrap it up for today. Um, again, if this is going a little fast, I'll be posting all the, uh, the lectures in video form um, on, uh, on D2L. Again, that not, not doing PowerPoints because it's too easy to just copy and paste anything. I want you to actually do the writing down yourself, whether that's typing or whether that's writing in a book. Um, but great work today. Uh, and I will start working on some example essay questions for Friday. And have a wonderful couple days. And I will see you all here on Wednesday, all right? Have a great couple days, guys.